With all the Scottish peaks long since scaled, climbers like Dave Cuthbertson seek out new challenges on comparatively small pieces of rock. This Glen Nevis rock face may not look much. It's only 80 feet high. But if Dave is successful, Ring of Steel will be the hardest route yet climbed in Scotland. This well-rehearsed technical exercise bears little relationship to climbing's original purpose. Yet, in a real sense, all of the great post-war climbers in Scotland, the Marshalls, Bonningtons and Cuthbertsons, are merely carrying on a tradition that was created a hundred years ago in the golden age of mountaineering. In the sport of mountaineering, uh, there are moments that just don't come back. There was a golden age in the Alps around the time of the ascent of the Matterhorn, the 60s, the 70s. And there was a, a golden age here on Ben Nevis, on Sky and elsewhere. Uh, you can't uh, re recapture these, uh, these great days. Many are the memories one can bring back from the mountains, but they're all memories of freedom. The restraint of ordinary life no longer holds us down. We are in touch with nature. The sky, the winds, the waters, and the earth. Nowhere in the British Islands are there any rock climbs to be compared with those in sky. Measure them by what standards you will. Length, variety, or difficulty. These are the words of the first great climber in Scotland, an English chemistry professor called Norman Colley. Colley came to Skye in 1886, fell in love with its mountains, and explored the entire Cooling Ridge with the local guide, John Mackenzie. Hold on, John. Professor Norman Colley was an eminent Victorian. He was one of the greatest scientists of his age, taking the first medical x-ray pictures and constructing the first Neil lamp, whilst also being a painter and a cartographer. Above all, he was an outstanding mountaineer who climbed in the Alps and the Canadian Rockies, as well as in Scotland itself. His contribution to Scottish mountaineering was to preempt Scottish mountaineers themselves. Uh, the wind was really taken out of the sails, for example, when he climbed Tower Ridge and made the first ascent, and the first winter ascent of Tower Ridge and Ben Nevis. People started climbing the sky well before they started climbing in Ben Nevis and Glen Cove because it was easier to get to it. Well, if you want to return, John. I think there's no doubt that the Cullen was uh, Collie's particular enthusiasm. He uh, began to climb here in 1884, and he climbed here for several years before he became involved with uh, alpine climbing. He spent something like 20 summers uh, up here until the start of the first war, and then of course he returned here and stayed here for 12 years from 1930 to his death. So the Cullen was his uh, his love. This is the Scottish Mountaineering Club Library. Norman Colley was a member of the club for 50 years and contributed regularly to the club journal. His writings tell us something of his character, revealing an almost mystical reverence for the Scottish hills. Here was a scientist with a soul who not only climbed all the major mountains of sky, but mapped them and measured them as well. The original Borden survey maps were everywhere wrong. Uh, people had only begun to climb there in the 1870s. As far as I could make out, uh, what the Borden survey had done really was to obtain heights for Skurn and Gillian and uh, Bruch and Free. Um, and the rest was really just a kind of eye sketch without any detailed surveying. Um, so uh, when Collie started climbing here, uh, the maps were essentially uh, uh, useless. Uh, the 
Martins were all in the wrong place. The first mountain Collie climbed with Mackenzie was at Ambastier. With its twin peaks, it was one of the Coolan's most prominent landmarks. Retracing Collie's route up Ambastier are two experienced mountaineers, John Lyle and Alan Kimber. Dressed in period climbing costume and sporting a deerstalker, Lyle plays John Mackenzie, while Kimber is a flat cat Norman Collie. Whenever he came to Skye, Norman Collie climbed with John Mackenzie. No one else would do. Theirs was a friendship of the mountains, which was first forged on Ambastia. No more rope now. I'll wait here, John. Good. Right, John, follow on. So what is the modern verdict on this climb first made in 1889 with fairly primitive gear? Climbing equipment, the rope and the boots, things like that, I mean, they've developed such a lot, but so has the sport and the difficulty of things that people do uh, that's been needed. But I think, in a sense, for the time they did it, this was, this was superb. The clothing is, uh, 
It's not too bad. The collars look stiff. I wouldn't fancy wearing these collars anymore. I don't know how they got on with those. And as for the tie and the cufflinks, it's, uh, it's a bit peculiar. I found these boots a little bit hard to get, come to terms with, especially on the bus on dying areas. If the, if the rot's rough, it's, uh, they, they grip quite well. But there's a certain angle beyond which you have to be a bit careful. Oh, you can try it. Here, I think. leave a legacy of the details of the first ascent, but Norman Collie wasn't like that. He disliked the idea of recording his roots in such minute detail. In fact, he said it was like stripping the mountains of their mystery. He was more interested in exploration and the discovery of mountains like these, undeniably the most impressive in Britain. One of his greatest discoveries was the Keogh, a huge tower of rock distinguished by its characteristic shadow. Collie first climbed it with Mackenzie in 1906. Now? Oh. The key is a thousand feet high, a daunting prospect for early mountaineers. I 
good anchor here. Hold on, excellent. Partners on the mountain, Mackenzie and Collie, came from very different social backgrounds. The attraction of opposites is how Alan Kimber sees it. Collie had travelled the world. He was a, a great scientist, and chemist, a very good teacher, a very clever person. And John Mackenzie, a, a crofter from down the road at Sconset, never even left the island of Skye, you know. But they both got on so well together. They appreciated each other's company and each other's own ability in a different sort of way. Fine climbing, John. Fine climbing. Excellent. Very good. Which way do you think? So get to that one. My main feeling about Collie was the way he created friendships with one or two particular people, um, people like Mummery in the Alps and Hastings maybe. He got on very well with them in a climbing set, and I think that was the important thing as far as Collie was concerned. I'll stay here, John. Excellent. Very good. Collie made several trips to the Alps in the 1890s, but he much preferred Skye. Too many tourists at Zermatt, he said. Too much undesirable humanity. wild beauty, Skye was Collie's perfect place. Whatever his shortcomings, and he could be arrogant and aloof, Collie was a loyal and generous friend. When asked to address the Alpine Club, he sang John Mackenzie's praises. He is the only real British climbing guide that has ever existed, Collie said, and a first-rate rock climber. Inevitably, though, it was Collie who picked up the honours. Presidency of the Alpine and Cairngorm Clubs and Vice Presidency of the Royal Geographical Society. He even had a mountain named after him on Sky. Skur Horovic is Gaelic for Norman's Peak. I would say that Norman Cock should be considered to be right up there amongst the best of the exploration climbers in Scotland. He was around at the time when there was a lot of exploration and he was at the forefront of it. He's discovered a lot of fine routes. Tower Ridge on the Nevis made the first ascent of that in only five hours. A lot of people take 25 hours over a day. Thank you, John. Thank you. We're nearly there. Wonderful. Of all Collie's classic routes, the Keogh was the one he climbed most often. With its circuitous path, its cracks, gullies, and traverses, it was full of interest. The 
climb comes to a spectacular conclusion. To reach the top of the Kios Tower, mountaineers have to cross the knife edge of rock that acts as its drawbridge. With a sheer drop on either side, this is no place for people of a nervous disposition. Climbing mountains, Collie said, was like entering a new world. Essentially a private man, Collie was a reticent hero from the golden age of mountaineering. isolated figure haunting sky sliggerkin in. One of the last to see him was a young RAF pilot on sick leave during the war who wrote in his diary, We were alone in the inn, save for one old man who'd returned there to die. His hair was white, but his face and bearing were still those of a great mountaineer. He never spoke, but appeared regularly at meals to take his place at a table tight pressed against the windows, alone with his wine and memories. 